Good evening. We will be in Ephesians chapter 3 this evening. Ephesians chapter 3. As I speak to uh, different Christians, I try to encourage, especially the newer Christians, uh, and let them know that it's going to be a roller coaster ride. Uh, there's going to be ups and downs throughout life. Uh, it's not all rainbows and butterflies and lollipops and all that good stuff. It, it's, it's great when those times come and, and we enjoy those times a lot, but there are times when it becomes very difficult to continue to press on to do the things that God has called us to do. Um, I know there's, there's been plenty of times like that in my life, and, and as the world gets more corrupt and as more and more evil abounds, uh, it, it can get especially disheartening. Uh, but as we study scriptures together, as we come together, we're, we're supposed to be encouraging one another, building one another up, to remain faithful in the Lord and doing the things that we are called to do. Uh, Ephesians has been an extremely encouraging book for me, and I hope it has been for you as well. As we've studied through this book, we've learned a lot about uh, what God has done for us to, to lift us up out of those difficult times and to help us understand God's love for us and how great that love is that He's poured out for us through Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul hasn't really held anything back. He's, he's told us about all the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. Uh, we, are, we are beloved children of God, uh, who even though we were dead in our trespasses and sins, He has resurrected us and brought us to new life in Christ and forgiven us of all our debt. He's made us a part of His family and a part of His holy temple as we are united with Him and united with one another. What a wonderful message that is for us. And, and there's a reason behind all of the madness of, of the, the, the many things that are going on in our life. There's a purpose that is, is in our lives that we need to grasp and understand and take hold of and, and make sure that it's at the forefront of our minds whenever times get difficult, that there is a reason for this, that God has... Uh, a design and an understanding of everything that's going on in our lives, and He can work all things together for our good. Uh, and we've seen that a lot throughout uh, Ephesians 1 and 2. He's, he's the reason why we received grace. He worked in uh, our lives. He prepared the gospel for us, and He provided it for us. And, and there's plenty for us to latch on to in those first two chapters and find a lot of hope. Well, as we go into chapter 3... Uh, I want to remind you that chapters 1 and 2 had some very odd grammatical parts to them. And chapter 3 is not any different. Remember the run-on sentence in chapter 1 and then the other run-on sentence in chapter 1. Uh, so, so as we come into chapter 3, we see another kind of odd grammatical thing. When it says, For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles... Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, that did you notice something odd here? Let's pause. Notice, for this reason, I, and then he starts talking about himself. I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. You see how he's, he just, he doesn't tell us what he's doing. There's no verb. For this reason, I, Paul, do what? <laughs> and what is he talking about here? What is the reason that, that he's talking about? Well, he said for this reason because he means everything prior to this. All of the information that, that I've given you, right? We're coming in at a later part. And there's, there's a lot of information feeding into this. For this reason is saying because God has added the Gentiles into the body of Christ. Those who are far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And God has made them a part of the family and given them all the rights as citizens of the kingdom and 
put them into his temple as living stones that are established on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. He says, for this reason, I do what? (laughs) Well, it doesn't tell us at this point. But he tells us later in verse 14, notice. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. It's a weird sentence, a weird weird grammatical thing. Again, we find in the book of Ephesians, Paul doesn't abide by the rules, you know. He's, he's dictating this and maybe he's, he's, he, he starts to say, for this reason I am bowing my knees before the Father. And then some side thought comes into his mind and he starts thinking about that. And he, he says, i got to talk about this before I tell you what I'm doing because of all these things that have been revealed to me. Uh, he, he wants to express this. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at this side note that goes really from verse 1 all the way through to verse 13 and try to understand what all of this is about. First of all, notice and pay attention to the fact that he's, he's starting to think about what he's just said, right? For this reason, he's thinking about the reason he goes to God in prayer. Because God has done all of this for you Gentiles, I'm bowing my knees before the Father, but I just, I I need to tell you some more information. We need to talk a little bit more about the reason that was given before we come into a discussion about me bowing my knees before the Father. I need to tell you something else. There's there's a, a, a side note that I need to go into before I get to the prayers that I'm saying on your behalf, I want to make sure you understand the reason for my prayer. So all this stuff that I said in the first two chapters, let me tell you why I said all that. And let me explain it and condense it for you so that it makes more sense to you. Really, he just wants them to understand the reason for his prayer even more. And so as we study this together, we're going to understand more of the reason why Paul prays for the Ephesians. And later on next, uh, next week, Lord willing, we'll go through and learn about his prayer for the Ephesians. But the prayer is mind-blowing. I mean, it's, it's an amazing prayer, and I don't even know if we'll get through all of it in one sitting. But it, it's, it's worthy of this additional explanation in order to make very clear sense about why he's praying in this way. He says all of these things. So what does he say? Well, in this text, as we study this evening, we're going to see that Paul explains who he is a little bit more. He wants them to understand who he is. Now, that may seem kind of silly because they know him, right? I mean, to them, he is the preacher who taught them the gospel, And he is now imprisoned in Rome, and and that's the relationship that they have with him. But he wants them to understand more about who he is and and his perspective on things before he goes into his prayer. So this is what he says. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, How the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So he starts describing who he is and what he has been sent to do, which is kind of odd at this point in the letter, but still he wants them to know he is a steward of the revelation of God's ministry, God's mystery. A steward is a a servant that you give more responsibility to. He is over a part of the house, like Joseph over Potiphar's house. He was Potiphar's steward 
Uh, and then he became Pharaoh's steward. And, and Paul now says, I was made a steward of the mystery of God. I was made a steward of the mystery of God to you Gentiles to reveal this mystery to you because it was made known to me that I might make it known to you. Well, what is this mystery? Right? Every time that we see the word mystery, we start thinking, ooh, what is this? You know, maybe there's something here. We like a good mystery, don't we? Um, so what's the mystery here? Well, the mystery is the mystery that was kept secret in the Old Testament. It was, it was, it was talked about in the Old Testament, but nobody really understood it. And the mystery is something that even in the New Testament, when Jesus showed up, nobody really understood it. It was this this odd thing that, that people were seeing in Jesus, they were confused, you know, they were, they were wondering about it. What is all this? And, and Peter tells us that the prophets who were writing down the things that would take place in the New Testament, the mystery, it, it baffled them. And they wanted to know, they wanted to understand when and how would these things happen. And it says even angels longed to see what it is that God was going to do. It was a mystery to them. And all of that mystery is being revealed, right? It's not still a mystery, but it was made known to Paul so that he could make it known to everybody else. It's not a mystery anymore. It was a mystery, and now it's been revealed to Paul in a way that he can reveal it to the Gentiles. And essentially, it's uh, that salvation would come not because we do all the right things, you go, to the, you go to the Old Testament, you go to Jesus' arrival, and everybody's thinking what? In order to receive all the blessings and the promises of God, you have to do all the right things. And so they would do everything they could to do all the right things. And then they would earn it, and then they would become righteous enough to deserve salvation being given to them. But the mystery wasn't about that. That's the way they thought it should be. The mystery revealed that God accomplished redemption for the Gentiles and the Jews through the suffering and the murder of Jesus. That's what the mystery was really all about. The redemption, the, the ransom that was paid for our sins. That's what he talked about a lot in chapter 2. This was the mystery. So he's condensing a lot of chapter 2. Notice he, he describes the mystery in verse 6. He says, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. The mystery is that the Gentiles who have not kept the law, who have not done the right things, can be added into the body of Christ, can receive the forgiveness of their sins and the redemption that God is offering to mankind. And so that was the great mystery that has been revealed. And Paul is the one who is bringing about the revelation of that mystery. Notice what he says in verse 3. The mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. He just wrote about it in chapters 1 and 2. In fact, chapter 1 even refers to the fact that it was a mystery uh, back in verse uh, 9. It says, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Now, this is going to be important in just a little bit, but you see the mystery was that God had this great plan to unite all things, to bring the Gentiles, the Jews together. And the mystery was made known to Paul by revelation, and now he has written this briefly so that when you read this, you can perceive my insight, verse 4 of chapter 3, into the mystery of Christ. This is not a mystery that, that can't be understood. This is not a mystery that's still hidden, but it's a mystery that has now been revealed in the writing of the Apostle Paul. We can understand what has been revealed. It's not a mystery that uh, we all have to figure out individually. A lot of times people think that uh, we need some special revelation from God in order to understand what God has 
in store for us, in order to understand God's plan for us. We all need some special uh, inkling or, you know, notion or warm feeling or something like that that's going to reveal to us what God wants us to do and what, what, what God has in store and what God is trying to get us to do in our lives. Well, that's not the way that this mystery is ever talked about. It's, it's talked about in a way that uh, it, it has been revealed through the apostles and prophets and as we read these things, we can understand what God had always intended. God is not, at this stage, mysterious to us. He is not unknown to us. There are things about Him that we don't quite grasp or fully understand, but His plan of salvation and His desire, His will for us in life has been fully revealed through Paul. Paul is this special apostle. Uh, as we study through the New Testament, we get the picture that he's something else, right? You've got the 12, which we've been learning a lot about on Sunday morning, and then you've got the apostle Paul. Paul's not like the 12 in that his ministry is very clearly different from the ministry of the 12, and he talks about that as well. Verse 7, he says, of this gospel... I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power to me. Though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Notice the, the, the repetition of this idea that the mystery that was hidden for ages has now been revealed through Paul. Paul is, has been given a ministry especially to the Gentiles. And whenever you go back to his conversion in Acts chapter 9, you remember he's on the road to Damascus and then Jesus shows up and says, Paul, Paul, why, or Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he covers his eyes with a film and has to be led to a town where Ananias comes out and, uh, and he tells him exactly what God has in store for him. Jesus has a plan for Saul that he would be the minister to the Gentiles. And... As we read in Galatians, we find out he spends about 15 years in, a, in um, a town and he's learning and he's growing and then he goes out in the book of Acts and he starts preaching at all these different places and establishing all these different churches and all these different Gentile regions. And that was his mission. That's, that's the way he describes his work. He was given the, the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles. The unsearchable riches of Christ. That was his whole work. Did you notice how he describes himself? He says, I was made a minister uh, according to the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given. What made Paul so special that he would be the apostle to the Gentiles? Was it all of his Hebrew training that he had in the past as he studied at the feet of Gamaliel? Is that what qualified him and made him such a wonderful minister going out to the Gentiles? Well, notice the way he words it is. It was all a gift had nothing to do with his own accomplishments or his own smarts or his own intelligence or anything like that. That wasn't what made him the perfect minister to the Gentiles. That wasn't why God chose him. He says, God was gracious toward me. God gave me a huge gift of grace that I did not deserve. And it was according to the working of his power that I became a minister to the Gentiles. It wasn't because I was so intelligent and I knew the right places to go and I knew the right things to say and I did all these wonderful things because I'm so great. He says, I was the very least of all the saints. 
Why? He persecuted the saints. He was an enemy of the saints. You see how he, he views himself that his salvation and his ministry is all because of the grace of God that was given to him. It is not of himself. It is not of his own abilities or his own greatness. And, and you see in him a great example of humility. And really that just ties in so well with our study of Matthew and talking about greatness, doesn't it? We see that Paul sees himself as the least. And yet, as we study the New Testament, we see him as the first. Here's the man who wrote 13 of the 27 letters in the New Testament. And here he says, I'm, I, I'm the least, though I am the very least of all the saints. Not though I was the very least, though I am the very least of all the saints. We know that Paul's gone through great sufferings and trials. We know that he's done wonderful works uh, with extreme faith and trust in God. And we see him as the greatest of all the saints who's ever lived. And we just want to be like Paul. And we just want to, we, we'd love to meet him and to, to understand more of what he was thinking and why he did what he did. But really, we need to see our suffering in this life our, our work, our ministry, that Christ, that God has given us, whatever it is, in the same way. That this is a gift of God that was given to me, not because I'm so great, but because He wanted to give it to me, and I don't deserve it. I'm undeserving. But I'm, I've been given this ministry, I've been given this role, and this is what I'm here to do, and I'm not going to stop until the work is done. And it's a great work. I mean, I love the way he describes this work. I get to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. I mean, doesn't that sound like just an amazing work to get to enlighten people, help people understand and, and, and fully grasp what God has done for them? I feel that as I get to share the word with people. It's just, it's an exciting, it's a fun thing to get to open people's eyes up to who God really is and what God has done for them and what is in store for them. And you see that Paul wants them to be encouraged to know that they have all these riches waiting for them because God has given them grace. Even though they are uh, maybe least or less than the Jews, Paul says he's the least of all the saints. And look at what God's given me. And so the less you are, the, the more God wants to bless. And this is the way God does things. After he talks all this time about himself, he starts to transition into talking about them. Because he wants to use all this information about himself, the way he sees himself and, and the work that he's been given to do, to help them understand the way they should see themselves and the way they should see the work that God has given them to do. So who are they? Look at this. He was made a minister to the Gentiles to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ to bring to light to everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why does Paul reveal this mystery? Why is Paul working and laboring so hard to enlighten everyone on what God has done for them? He says, so that the church can make known the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now, that's a lot of big words. It's a long sentence. There's a lot there. Manifold means multifaceted. It's kind of like, you know, a color wheel. You've got lots of different shades and different aspects. And so he says, he's doing all this so the church can make known to, to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places 
the manifold wisdom of God. How broad, how wonderful God's wisdom is that he's able to save all and bring them uh, to, to the state that they are his glory, the praise of his glory. And as he says this, we might think, well, what does all this mean? If we remember back in Deuteronomy chapter 4, Israel was supposed to be God's glory to the nations. They were supposed to be this unique group of people that as they went out and they, uh, they, they did the righteous acts that God had told them to do, all the nations around them would see and they would understand that the God of Israel is the one true God. He's amazing. But notice... We're given a similar purpose, but our purpose is a little bit different. We're meant to glorify God to all the nations, but there's also in the spiritual realm angels and demons, right? Spiritual, the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places is the, the angels, the demons, those who are uh, in powers in the spiritual realm. And we find that very clearly stated in chapter 6, verse 12, where he talks about these powers of wickedness and, and all of that. So... That's pretty interesting, right? Paul is revealing all this so that the church could make known the manifold wisdom of God to the spiritual rulers and authorities who are in the spiritual realm. We're supposed to do that? <laughs> That's the purpose that the church has been given? Paul's purpose is the ministry to these Gentiles, and then he wants to make this ministry, these Gentiles, a part of the church, the temple of God, and as they become a part of this, they become to the praise of his glory, and eventually they shine so that everybody can see how wonderful, how wise God is, even those in the spiritual realm. Well, how are we supposed to do this? I mean, that's a lot of responsibility that we're supposed to somehow show God's manifold wisdom. How do we do that? Has anybody ever done that before? Like, what does that mean? I think he's pointing us to the idea that the church is supposed to be not just like a country club where we, we get together and we hang out and we we maybe encourage each other a little bit and, and spend some time together, but that the church is supposed to be something more. It's supposed to be, in a sense, a, a new society. I like the way this was put. F.F. Uh, F. Bruce said that the church is a new society, not just a fellowship. A society where the world can see exhibited what family life, business life, economic practices, and race relations will be like under the healing hand of Jesus' kingship. I love that idea, that picture, that, that the church is this society where we exemplify righteousness. We exemplify how it's supposed to be, what God had intended uh, humanity to look like, that we're supposed to become that so that the world can see and understand and glorify God. But do you notice how he says even the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places would be seeing this? I think it goes beyond that. It's not just about becoming this society that is working together and that is good and, and acting and doing the right things all the time in the right places, but it's also having a completely transformed heart inside of us that shows that God is truly wise. I mean, you can coerce people, you can force people to do all the right things, and you can demonstrate your power over them, but wisdom is demonstrated in the complete transformation of the hearts that God is seeking to create inside of us. This makes me wonder, though, what's being put on display when we, as the body of Christ, fail to have transformed hearts? What's being put on display when we fail to become a new society? What does the world see? 
We don't desire holiness. That's not in our heart. That's not our heart's desire. We don't desire fellowship with one another. We don't desire good works. We don't desire a greater understanding of the word of God. When our hearts are really pursuing other things, what's happening? What's happening to the the glory of God? What's happening to the perspective that the people of the world have on God's wisdom? Is he really that wise? I mean, there's not really a transformation. Nothing really has happened. They're, They're the same old sinners, and they're doing the same old things, and they don't really care that much more than they did before. You see how that might defame God in the spiritual realm? Rather than exalt him and glorify him, that might tear down his image. So as we approach spiritual things with the attitude of, well, I guess I got to get my pajamas off on Sunday morning and I got to go to work or got to go to services and I guess I got to go to Bible class and, and I guess I got to, you know, do the right things at work because I don't want to, you know, have people think the wrong things about me. As we, as we approach it with those kind of desires and those kind of attitudes... Are we really displaying the wisdom of God to transform our hearts? Have have our hearts been transformed? You see the problem. I want you to picture for just a moment having a camera on you at all times. Sees every single aspect of your life, much like the Truman Show, right? A movie that came out a while back now, Jim Carrey movie. Uh, where the, the camera's on him at all times, watching every move he makes, and everybody's enjoying it and watching it and, and seeing who he is and, and seeing how he's grown and how he's developed and, and, who he, and what he's become. Does that scare you? <laughs> Can you imagine having billions of people watching your every move in life? How would that impact the way you act in life? How would that impact the way you approach certain things in life? What kind of picture would you want people to see about who you are? How careful would you be about the way you approach others and the way you approach God? You know, we we a lot of times... We claim to have that desire to please God. And we show it by doing a number of things. But if the camera was on us at all times, maybe it would find that sometimes we slack off and we just do whatever we want to do. And we do this or we do that. We're distracted all the times. Maybe it would find sometimes we're not really putting forth our best effort. But thankfully, we don't have a camera like that, right? And so we don't have to worry about people seeing us whenever we're just slacking off and distracted or doing other things and not really caring anything about God's God's stuff, right? Nobody sees that. Wait a second. Look at this text. Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Where are those rulers and authorities? What can they see? Can they see in our bedrooms? Can they see in our workplaces? Can they see in our offices, maybe with the door closed? Can they see everything in our life? Can they see in our minds, in our hearts? It's kind of a scary thing. Does what they see convince them that God has manifold wisdom because of the transformation he's created in us? You see how that is supposed to help us understand that there's more going on than what meets the eye in our lives. Yeah, people don't see it. And they don't really understand or know about all these other things that we're doing. And and we can fool the people around us who don't see any of those things. We know God sees it, but what about the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places? And, And what do they think about God whenever I do these things and I'm not really living the transformed life? 
That's really the question, isn't it? That Paul wants to put before the Ephesians. Paul wants them to understand that there is a bigger picture that we often fail to see. God has an eternal purpose in mind for all of us. And he wants us to understand that purpose. And he wants us to fulfill that purpose by becoming people who are truly transformed in our hearts to be to the praise of his glory. I love what he says as you continue. Verse 11, this was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Now, as I said all that about, you know, everybody in the spiritual realm sees what we're doing, maybe a lot of us are just kind of like, mm, that ain't good. That's, whew. Um, we're in a bad place right now and everybody sees all that and they know and now we're just exposed and we're naked and we're just kind of like, well, what are we supposed to do? Well, what he says here is, God had an eternal purpose to make us into what we're supposed to be, to transform our hearts. So if we realize that and we see that our heart's not been in the right place, we need to understand God still wants us to be what we're called to be. He wants us to be changed. He wants us to be transformed. And he's, he wants it so bad that he will forgive all of this past rebellion or stubbornness or laziness or apathy or whatever it is that's going on in our lives. And it says, in Christ, we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So from this point forward, we can live as though the spiritual realm is a reality. As though the spiritual rulers in the heavenly places are seeing every move we make and every decision and every word and every action is being taken note of. And it's either giving God tremendous glory as they see the heart has been transformed or it's defaming him. And if our past has defamed God, then our present and our future should be to glorify him and recognize that he has tremendous grace toward us who believe. We can have boldness and access with confidence. What is that talking about? Access to the throne of God to find grace to help in time of need. Access to the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin if we truly believe, if we have faith in the sacrifice that was made being once for all delivered to cover all of our sins. Paul is saying all this to help these Christians understand that they're here to fulfill a purpose in God's eternal plan. And that as they live their lives and as they deal with the struggles and the trials and all the things that they're going to deal with, God is there with them working and trying to help them become to the praise of his glory. So everybody can see, all those in the spiritual realm that he sees all the time can see and be united with us to say, God is wise, God is full of grace and mercy beyond our imaginations. But Paul is also saying this because he's in prison. And if you're going through suffering like Paul is going through, he wants them to understand his perspective on things. That, you know, it looks like everything's going bad for me. It looks like I am losing and, and that there's some kind of kink in God's plan because I'm, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles and here I am in prison. I can't do the work that God has given me to do. God has failed somehow. And maybe that would cause them, as he says in verse 13, to lose heart. But notice what he says in verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Notice who he's a prisoner of. He's not a prisoner of Rome. It says, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. 
He's just there in that prison cell knowing that the only reason why he's in that prison cell is because Jesus has said that he would be in that prison cell. If, if, if Jesus didn't want him to be in the prison cell, he wouldn't be in the prison cell. If Jesus, if Jesus didn't have a plan for Paul to stand before kings and to preach the gospel before Caesar, then he wouldn't be in the prison cell. And so his perspective is, even though he's through this, in this slump where everything looks like it's negative and everything looks like it, it's not going to work out for the good and everybody might be defaming Paul and maybe wanting to defame God, Paul wants them to understand that there's a bigger picture here. That there's rulers and authorities in the heavenly places that are seeing Paul's faith. They're seeing Paul work even in prison. And that God has a bigger plan for Paul even when things look horrible. Because of that, verse 13, he says, I do not want you to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. In verse 1 he said, I am a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. And now he says, don't lose heart over what I'm suffering because my suffering is for you. And it is your glory. It's kind of a weird way to say all of that. It's kind of confusing. But what does he mean? He wants them to understand his situation is not a mistake. He wants them to understand that just because life gets hard, just because there's suffering, just because things seem to go south, that doesn't mean that Jesus is not in control. He has complete faith that Jesus is still in control. He is doing everything, working everything according to his will. So then why is this for the Gentiles? Well, in one sense it's for the Gentiles because he was preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. And the Jews hated him for it, and so they threw him in prison. So he's in prison on behalf of the Gentiles. But in another way, what we can see as we look at the big picture is, Paul is in prison to help them understand it's okay. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be trials. There's going to be times in your life when everything seems to be going wrong, and it seems like God is not being glorified with your life. But don't lose heart. God is still in control, and he is still able to work all things for his good. Many of Paul's letters were written while he was in prison. God used his prison sentence as an opportunity to spread the message even further, as Paul is responsible for converting millions, maybe billions of Gentiles, and maybe even Jews, into Christ. I know that all this is really deep and complicated and theological in many ways, but I hope we can appreciate that Paul wants to take this side road to, to just encourage them, to tell them it's okay. Don't lose heart. I am your minister. I have been given this purpose. I'm fulfilling this purpose. And you must fulfill your purpose. But you can't do that if you lose heart. You have to show the rulers and authorities in the spiritual realm that God is wise in a multifaceted way. He's, he's so much wiser, so much greater than the rulers of this world who think they can squash Christianity by taking one of the leaders and putting him in prison. That's not going to do it. And it's not going to stop you either. Whatever your trial, whatever your struggle, God can use it to bring about his glorification. Don't lose heart over what I'm suffering and don't lose heart over what you're going to go through because he hasn't. So the application of this is kind of difficult because we're not in the same situation as the Ephesians, right? The person who preached the gospel to us is not in prison right now and, and not about to die, but we struggle, right? We lose heart sometimes. Things, things burden us. 
And we might think that we're failing and we might think that, that something's wrong, that maybe God's not working or God's not able to do anything for us and everything seems to be going south. As we fail, we might be tempted to just give up, lose heart, lose a desire to do the things that God wants us to do. We, we might let our heart go back to the ways of the world. Instead of pursuing God with all our heart, we might choose uh, to go back and be distracted. We might have setbacks that, that take us to the old way of life instead of pursuing more into what God wants us to do. We might have trials that come upon us that cause tremendous suffering, and, and we might think, well, I can't do anything for the Lord at this time because I'm just suffering. I'll tell you, Paul did tremendous work while suffering. I've seen Christians all over do tremendous work while suffering, because faith is shown most brightly in the midst of our trials and our suffering, if we don't lose heart. And maybe as these Ephesians lose heart, whenever they watch someone they love, someone they respect, someone they look up to suffer, maybe sometimes we lose heart as someone we love suffers. And there's nothing we can do, right? There's a sense of helplessness. But you see, Paul's attitude is maintain faith that God is still good and he's still in control and keep showing the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places that God has transformed your heart. No matter what comes in life, let them see God knew what he was doing when he saved your soul. He was making a child who is to the praise of his glory who loves him, and who loves others as he has loved him. Does this help us find strength to go on? That was Paul's desire. He took a break from his prayer to, to give them all this, to kind of build them up and to help them to know that you're here for a purpose. God sees you. God knows what's going on in your life. And you must keep pressing on. Because that's what I'm praying for. And we'll read a lot more about that in the next section. I'm really, really excited about the next section. But overall, we can have faith in the eternal purpose of God for our lives. That God is, is able to create in us a heart that loves Him. If, if we will pursue Him, He pursues us. He, ed he edifies us. He molds us to be pleasing in his sight. And so if you're struggling and, and things have gone south, turn your heart to him and he will help you. And all of the angels and all the demons will be watching and seeing and praising God over how wise and wonderful he is because of you and because of me. We have that ability in ourselves because God has done this for us, because God has given this to us. We can be to the praise of his glory. And when we mess up, we have boldness, and we have confident access to God. And we can turn to him with our hearts, and we can find forgiveness and grace. And even in our mistakes, our humility toward God and our turning to him will again show his wisdom. As we're righteous, we show his wisdom. As we fail but then turn to him, we show his wisdom. Give God the glory for the wonderful gifts he has done for you. If you're here tonight and you've not began the, to, to give God glory in your life by living a transformed life that seeks to please him, will you please make the change? Help the body to grow and to become what it ought to be through your work, through your mission. Help others to see the wisdom of God. Help others to see how, how he's been working in your life and, and encourage them to be faithful and not lose heart. Overcome. That's what we're here for. And if we can help you in any way, please let us help you as we stand and as we sing. Please come.